I have some not fake news, but fake good news for you. And then I have some bad news and then some good news. So the fake good news is that according to the numbers, the divorce rate in our country is going down. And so there were more divorces uh, 20 years ago and even 10 years ago, and we look at the numbers, divorce rates are going down. That is the fake good news. Now, why is that fake? Because the reason divorce rates are going down is because less people are getting married, and therefore less people are getting divorced. So that's not necessarily a good sign. The bad news is that according to a couple of different sources, during the era of the coronavirus, divorce rates have spiked 34%. Now, we could guess why that is, and we'll get into that later. But all that to say that marriage is difficult. It's difficult to be married to someone else. And the reason that is, it's not because you picked the wrong person. It's that according to Genesis chapter 1, you picked and married someone who's made of dirt. They're made of dirt. From the dirt they come and to the dirt they're going to go. They are a sinner in rebellion against God, hopefully saved by grace. But you picked a flawed human being to whom you would be married. And so it makes this difficult. And guess what? They also picked a flawed human being made of dirt. But the good news is that God has not left this topic alone. He has not said, go get married, and I'm not going to give you any guidance. He has spoken to us on multiple levels how we can be good husbands and good wives and what this means. And we're not going to look at the entirety of what the scripture says about marriage, but we are going to look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. And so if you would turn there with me, we're going to just read these 11 verses. In Ephesians 5, what Paul has been doing, he has been describing how Christians filled with the Holy Spirit, proceeding from truth, and the daily renewing of their minds can live a life of good conduct, can live a life of holiness. That because we are spiritually dead, we have no ability to be good. We cannot live up to the standards that God has set, the ethical standards, but when we live a life in the Spirit, when we renew our minds daily, and when we learn to delight in the Lord over other things, then we can live a life of victory. With that said, with that foundation laid, what he's going to do in the rest of this chapter is he's going to address various demographic groups. He's going to address wives and husbands and slaves and children. He's going he's to speak to each group. And so today we're going to deal with husbands and wives. And so this is what it says in Ephesians chapter 5, starting with verse 22 from the ESV version of the Bible. This is what Paul says, wives. Submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and himself, its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to everything, in everything, to their husbands. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water and the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any other such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because... We are a member of this body, of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. The first thing that we're going to talk about today is to talk about submission. And the big idea is that as we exist in a marriage, one of the things that we have to learn to do is to love our spouses their way. We like as human beings in almost every arena to project. We have the way that we want to be loved. We have the way that we want to be treated. We have the way that we like it. And yet we're called to love them not according to our desires, but according to theirs, as we'll see. So the first thing we're going to talk about is this idea of submission. We need to speak to this because this is problematic. And I have to say that at the very heart of the Christian life is the idea of submission. 
at the very center of the Christian life is the abandonment of ourselves, the abandonment of our own lives, our own rights. And look what Jesus said about anyone who would follow him. He said, if anyone wants to be my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. Now, this was written in the context of Jesus' poll numbers being at their peak. What I'm saying is that he became very popular He's doing all these tricks. He can turn water into wine and he can walk on water. This is totally awesome. Let's follow this guy. He gives out free food. And at one point, they were even trying to make him king. They said, if this guy can feed us, let's make him king. We'll follow him and then we'll overthrow Rome. And so he was becoming very, very popular. And and it was for shallow reasons. And Jesus says, okay, let's just settle this right now, okay? If you want to follow me, here's the requirement. Now, notice when he talks about the cross, Jesus hadn't been crucified yet. So they wouldn't necessarily know exactly what this meant, other than the cross was the equivalent of the electric chair. It's how they killed people, capitally. So he says, if you want to be my follower, you have to deny yourself, take up your electric chair, and come after me. Well, this was probably a hard pill to swallow. And whenever we are faced with difficulties in Scripture, we have to go back to this passage to recognize what is our role here. And my role, personally, is that I'm submission to Christ. He is my Lord. And what he says, I'm going to do my best to do, even if it's things that I don't like. So biblical marriage cannot be done halfway. We're not in charge. We have abandoned ourselves. Jesus is Lord. He has given us this person, and he has commanded us how we are to treat this person. By the way, the idea of submission is all over Scripture. James says that we must submit to God. Paul says that we must submit to the governing authorities. And the writer of Hebrews says that we're to obey our leaders and and submit to them. So all over the text is this idea of submission. And the scripture even tells husbands and wives to submit to each other. So I guess what I want to say is that if the word submission brings up an alarm that says, I'm not going to do that, then I think there's a deeper issue that needs to be worked through because we all have to submit. You might say, well, you know, uh, you're the pastor. You don't have to submit to people. I have, I have an elder board and I have to submit to them. Oh, well, what about all those uh, people who own their own businesses? They can do whatever they want. No, they have to submit to their customers or they're just not going to, they're going to lose them. So everyone has a group of people to whom they are accountable and whom they have to submit. There is no one that is autonomous, no one that is self-sufficient. We all have people to whom we have to submit. Now, even if you are the dictator of a country, like Kim Jong-un or something like that, he's got people that are trying to kill him and will poison him and, and would gladly replace him. And so no one has absolute power. We all have to submit to one another. Now, before we get into text, uh, this text, I want you to back up a little bit and look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. This is the verse we covered last week, and this is the verse that sets up this next section. Paul says, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. And so we are to submit to one another. You might say, well, what are the boundaries here? We'll get into that. So what we're going to do first is we're going to talk about wives. And you might say, ladies, why do we have to go first? Because that's the way the text is written. So Paul addresses the wives first, and then afterwards we'll address the husband. And so you might be tempted to think, well, well, what about them? What do they have to do? We'll get to them next, okay? But we're going to deal with the wives first. So verse 22 He says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And he goes on to say that the the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. And he says some things there that are kind of difficult. And he says, so they should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, this passage is in direct conflict with our culture. And I will say that this word and this verse and in this context, it may have sparked a negative emotion in you. The idea of women submitting to their husbands is about as popular as joining the association of lion hunting dentists or something like that, right? If if you were to get on social media as a guy and say, wives submit to their husbands, just quoting Paul and posting that as your status, just wait to see the flame wars that would occur. Here's the problem. 
I feel really bad. But this verse has been horribly misused. That you will have men out there, and I feel comfortable saying this, that you will have dirtbag men out there who don't love God, they don't love their wives, they don't love the Scripture, but they've gotten a hold of this passage, and they think it's funny, and they use it as a bludgeon. You see, what the Scripture presents is an entire system of how to be a spouse, And what some men like to do is throw everything away and take one verse out of context and say, woman, you have to submit to me. And so many women have been hurt by this. And so I understand, well, to the extent that I can, I understand that when when this is read or when this is heard, that this can be painful. So what exactly does Paul mean and how should this play out? Well, it's helpful to look at the summary at the end. In in chapter 5, verse 33, he summarizes his, his statement. He says, to sum up, the wife is to respect her husband. I believe that this submission concept is here for one reason and one reason only, to show respect. Now, contrary to popular opinion, Jesus said that in the beginning, God made us male and he made us female. And the genders are quite different. While women generally need to feel loved, men generally need to feel respected. And so what does that look like? It means speaking respectfully to him, speaking respectfully about him when you're with your friends, making him look good in public, taking care of his intimate needs, finding his love language and filling him. And some of you might say, but you don't know my husband. You don't know what he's done. You don't know, you don't know what type of person he is. And, and that may very well be true. But ladies, wives, you have been given a God-given command from Scripture that is not dependent on anyone else. This isn't a dependent command that says, if he does this, then you do this. This command exists by itself. It says, this, ladies, this, wives, is what you are to do. And this is why marriage isn't 50-50. It's not, I'll do my part if he does his. It means that if you want this to work, you're going to have to demonstrate love or respect to someone who may not deserve it. And this happens all the time in the workplace. You may have a, 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 a lady who works at a job and she has a boss. And the boss is immoral. The boss is a jerk. The boss um, is openly having an affair in the office. The boss isn't someone you like or respect. But when the boss says, hey, you need to be here at 8 o'clock, you're here at 8 o'clock. The boss says, I want uh, this report in by noon. The report's in by noon. He says, I want you to put the cover sheet on the TPS report. You put the cover sheet on the TPS report, right? And so in this scenario, the woman doesn't have to like the boss, but she's just doing what he says in that sense. Now, why would God command this? Because he knows that when the husband feels like he is respected, his heart will be filled. And maybe, just maybe, from the position of being filled and respected, you may begin to change the way that he treats you. Well, why do I have to go first? It's a non-dependent command. Now, look at the specificity in verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. He says, do this as unto the Lord or for the Lord. In other words, you're not doing this for your husbands. You have this relationship with God. You have this connection with God. And God is saying, this is how I want you to treat my son that I've given to you. And and this is how you are to do it. And I want you to do it for me, as to me, and under the power of me. This isn't about him. This is about us. Now, let me give you a strong caveat. Obeying God's commands in this passage does not require you to be a victim. This is not suggesting that you have to tolerate abuse. This isn't suggesting that you shouldn't stick up for yourself or have standards or that you can't advocate for your own needs. These are, those are extreme circumstances and those require a different response. But in normal, everyday relationship, the wives have been given commands to submit and to show respect as unto the Lord. Now, this may be offensive or not. I'll just leave it there. That's what the text teaches. Now we're going to get to the men, so don't worry. In verses 25 to 33, Paul says, husbands, love your wives. 
Now, I don't know if this means anything, but if you look at the, the, the paragraph, the wives have this much. The husbands, they get a little more. I don't know if that means they need more direction. I don't know. So in verse 25, he says, husbands, love your wives. And the obviousness of this statement does not exude any sort of profundity. I think that every man knows that he is supposed to love his wife, but the difficulty comes in that you ladies were made beautifully complex, and the male species seems wholly unable to perform this simple task on such a complex creature. But if we keep reading, we can learn exactly how to love our wives. He says, husbands, love your wives. How? Just as Christ, just as Christ loved the church. Well, now we're getting somewhere. So, men, you're supposed to love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Well, how did Christ love the church? Look what it says. He gave himself up for her. And so this is simple. We are to protect our wives from harm, even unto death. And our mantra is what Aragorn said to Frodo, if by my life or death I can protect you, I will. Now, of course, this command releases men from a lot of responsibility because the need to die for one's wife, although is significant, is rarely actualized. But there's more. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy. Now, one of the ways Christ loved the church was to make her holy, and this word simply means to set something apart as special. So how did Christ love the church? He set her apart as special, and this represents the biggest failure in men and loving their wives, and that is the setting of them apart. Now, we're great at doing this at the beginning, right? We would climb any mountain and swim any sea and traverse any plain, fight any battle to win her heart. And you know how it was at the beginning, uh, roses, chocolates, promises we don't intend to keep. It reminds me of a quote from the Merchant of Venice, whereby a certain man is attempting to win a certain unreachable woman. And this is what he says to her. I would outstare the sternest eyes that look, outbrave the most daring on the earth, pluck the young sucking cub from the she-bear, yea, mock the lion where he roars for prey to win thee, my lady. Men, we go to such great lengths to win them, but once we've got them, then we forget them. It's like the man whose wife complained, you never tell me you love me anymore. And he said, I told you I love you all those years ago, and if I change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> or what about the young lady who went to her mother and said, mom, I just got engaged, and my fiance, he keeps spending so much money on me, and I don't want him to spend so much money on him. How do I keep him from doing that? And, and the mom wisely said, well, get married, and all that will stop. This is a tragedy because the heart of woman is that she needs to be loved and sought and wooed all the days of her life. And so what does it look like? It means if you set her apart as holy, as something different, then you will continue to do for her and to her what you did at the beginning. It means that you continue to woo her and protect her, protect her from harm because Christ died for the church, protect her from yourself because she needs to feel safe around you, and to protect her from financial ruin. Dave Ramsey says the number one marital problem that exists between husbands and wives is financial. And avoid the off-handed submission verses. Now, guys, look. Margaret Thatcher said that being in charge is like being a lady. If you have to tell someone you are, you aren't. I would not recommend ever bringing up this passage. I just don't think it's going to do, I mean, I know it's kind of funny right now, but, but seriously, like, is that going to do any good? You know, she's not submitting to you and then you read to her Ephesians 5, and she's going to say, okay, you've read that, fine. Like, that's not going to happen. Come on, don't, don't bring it up. Your job is to love her and woo her and let God deal with her on that issue. So don't bring that up. That's just messed up. Now, some of you guys might say, you don't know my wife. You don't know what she's done. She disrespects me in, in public. She's sexually abandoned me. You don't, you don't know the things that she's done, and that may very well be true. But men, you have been given a command from Scripture that is not dependent upon anyone else. 
It's a non-dependent command. We are to do this regardless of what she does. And that's why marriage is not 50-50. It's not, I'll do my part when she does hers. This means that if you want this to work, you will have to demonstrate love to someone who may not deserve it. And so, men, you aren't commanded to like her. You aren't commanded to have feelings of affection for her. The command is to love her, woo her, set her apart, and protect her. Now, why would God command this? Because he knows that when the wife feels like her husband loves her and protects her, her heart will begin to be filled, and maybe, just maybe, from the position of being filled, she will begin to treat you the way you deserve. You might say, well, why do I have to go first? Because it's a non-dependent command. Now, look at the specificity in verse 22. Husband, love your wives just as Christ loved the church, and in a sense, you are to be her personal Jesus. Now, let me give you a strong caveat. Obeying God's command independently of behavior does not mean that you are to be a victim. You don't have to tolerate abuse. You should and can stick up for yourself and your rights, and you can advocate for your own needs. And there are extreme circumstances in life, but in normal everyday relationships, men, you have been given a command to love them as Christ loved the church. Love is a commandment, not a feeling. A feeling. And marriage, at times, is an act of will. All the people that I've spoken to that have been married 30, 40, 50 years, almost every single one of them hit a season where they said, we're done. This isn't going to work. And yet, because it's a choice, they held it together. Now, I, I can't remember where I heard this study, so I can't, I can't quote it for you. But um, in one of the marriage books I was reading a couple of years ago, it basically said that they've done studies on people that have gotten divorced and then remarried, and then the people who uh, held it together, even in a case of multiple adulteries or whatever you want to say, that five years later, the people that stuck it together, held it together, were happier and had better lives than the people who moved on. Now, it doesn't mean that if you have moved on, there's no hope. I'm saying that if you reach that point where you feel like it's over, You've got to hold on, not because of the way you feel, but what we're commanded to do. And so to the single folk today, I would say this is important because if you're planning on getting married, these are things you need to consider. You need to consider what does it take for me to be a wife or a husband? And what am I looking for in a spouse? And, and you wouldn't look just at this passage. There's other things to look at. But the scripture does speak to this. But to the married people, the husbands and wives, I would say, are you willing to submit yourself to God regardless of the cost? Are you willing to begin honoring the commands of Scripture even when your needs are not being met? Ladies, are you willing to demonstrate respect to your husband even when he is not respectable? Men, are you willing to love your, your wives when they are not being lovable? Will all of us learn to love our spouse the way he or she wants to be loved. Now, I've been reading up on this coronavirus issue, why divorces are spiking, and they've, they've come to two conclusions. The first one, and this is probably one that you would expect, is that marriages are crumbling because of the mask issue. It's horribly politicized. But one spouse is saying, I'm going out, I'm going to go hang out, I'm going to go eat dinner, I'm going to go be out there, and the other spouse says, no, it's dangerous, put on a mask. You can't go out, we're stuck inside. And so that same political divide that divides people is dividing marriages, and that's one of the issues. But the primary issue is just it comes down to pressure. You have high pressure, pressure situations, financial stress, personal stress, it's putting pressure on the marriage, and what's happening is dormant, old unresolved issues are being squeezed out. And now you have husbands and wives that maybe are stuck home together and they're having to deal with these unresolved dormant issues. And so that's why we're seeing a 34% spike. You know, in the last 10 years, I have been able to see God work miraculously in, in multiple marriages. I had some friends, and they've spoken publicly about this, that were married for, I don't know how long, 25 years, and they were not holding it together, 
and they split up. It's adultery on both sides, but these were Christians, and they had Christian brothers and sisters coming alongside them and confronting them, having those hard conversations, encouraging them, praying for them. And I think it took five years, five years of this couple being split and and being in rebellion against God and to each other. But eventually, they came back together, and God worked it out. And I remember meeting with them at a restaurant one time after this had, had come to pass, and they had gotten back together. And they were sitting in this booth, giggling. These people were in their 50s. And they're sitting there giggling, acting like junior hires with each other in the booth. Like, how does this happen? Because when we make a commitment to do it God's way, He will bring people back together. He will break that. He will heal that which has been broken. So before that even comes, Paul's advice to us, love your spouse the way he or she needs to be loved and how God commands and you will be able to have that strong marriage. The way that the enemy destroys civilizations is to break down families. He does that through divorce. And so the Lord's will is that we would have strong families, families that are unbreakable, families that that exist, that are rock solid. And that is done when we love our spouse the way God commands us to love them. Let's stand together and let's pray.